<laughs> right, thank you everyone for um, coming along today. I'm very excited for this talk because it's come all the way from London. Uh, so I've just got a brief biography about you and then it's up to you. Perfect. So um, Peter is the Managing Director and Head of Technologies with the MAM Real Assets, uh, where he coordinates the work of MAM Real Assets, Man Assets Management and Origination Trainings in identifying and applying emerging technologies that may impact the operational and environmental performance. Uh, of existing and future portfolio assets. Uh, prior to joining Macri in 2018, he's spent over 18 years in infrastructure, oil and gas, renewable energy, and transportation. He started his career at Shell, where he worked across the downstream value chain, including supply management, and procurement strategy, risk management, and commodities trading. Peter then served as a consultant to a range of industrial, financial, and governmental clients in renewable, transport, electrification, and emissions trading policy. Uh, he then spent five years at Saudi, Saudi Aramco's Realized the Emerging Technologies and Market Intelligence Division, which supported the development and launch of Saudi Arabia's renewable energy deployment through R&D, venture capital, and project development. Uh, Peter has a Master of Business Administration from the University of Oxford, Master of Science in Finance and Financial Law from SOAS University of London, a Master of Arts in International Relations from the University of Kent, and a Bachelor of Arts uh, in History from Arizona State University. Uh, and I'm very excited to stop. Well, thanks very much for, for making the IT work in the intro, and thanks for everyone having me. Um, as you heard, there's a lot of degrees in there, but uh, none of those degrees are engineering. Um, so as my former colleague at Saudi Aramco here and, and good friend Mohammed Al Chalabi would remind me, I'm not an engineer, uh, but I just sort of play one on television. Um, so why am I here to talk to you about this stuff today? So as per that intro, I've worked across the energy and transport and industrial sectors for quite a long time um, in all sorts of areas from sort of dirty fossil fuels and clean tech and, you know, you sort of name it, whether it's in transportation, aviation, ground transport, shipping, etc. cetera. Um, I'm really, really quite passionate about the energy transition and a lot of my time for the last 15 or 20 years has been looking over the horizon, even when I work in quite backward looking organizations, to say, well, what's the future gonna look like? And not only what's possible, um, what can we make happen? Um, so I, I'll talk a little bit about that sort of career transition that I made over time. Uh, and also how I think about um, what the future of energy holds and why I think what, what I think. So I'll give you a little disclaimer. I work for a financial institution, Macquarie Asset Management, so I'm glad you've all read that. Um, so today, <laughs> We'll talk a little bit about what we do as a team, this technology and innovation group, crucially how we think. Um, and this, I think, for especially a lot of undergraduates and graduates, bluntly even for a few professors, is one of the really crucial things is, is how you think about these things. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we think. Um, so the key takeaways I want you to, to take from this talk, right? At first principles, there is more than enough abundant clean energy resource available to humanity, right? More, many, many, many thousands times more than we need. The land that's required to, to harvest this or to take advantage of this technology is not insignificant, but it's also nowhere near what many people would tend to have in mind, right? We'll show just what we mean by that. The falling cost, for lack of a better term, um, they enable the decarbonization of the power sector, and the decarbonization of the power sector allows lots of other sectors to decarbonize, either directly through electricity or through the creation of clean molecules. Um, things like batteries, heat pumps, electric vehicles, you name it, electrolyzers are really about, in my view, going further with wind and solar. I have this debate often in industry and with colleagues that say, well, we need to go beyond wind and solar because we have to think about the really hard to decarbonize sectors, steel and heavy goods transport, shipping, aviation, sort of. But in reality, many of these technologies that we look at are really ultimately about making use of those clean electrons that we'll get largely, I think, at least from wind and solar, right? Um, and that sector coupling is really, really important, has all kinds of geopolitical impacts, it has policy impacts, economic impacts and others. So some principles that I'd say everybody should think about. Ask the questions, what if, why not, are you sure? Right, and I'll say what I mean. Be wary of all predictions, including anything I say, right? We'll talk a little bit about just how bad forecasting is. Some of the academic lecturing I do here at the university is about just how bad forecasting is and why uh, with the MBA program and one of the MSc programs. Think about the interrelatedness of drivers, how things feed on each other or feed against each other. And then think in first principles, that's really important for those of you who are physicists, engineers, et cetera. First principles are really important, but remember the world's bloody complicated. 
especially the energy world, there is no free market in energy, and there's not a blank slate of first principles, you know, blank slate of physics that we get to play with. We have to deal with the world as it is as well. So question, what do we do? Um, I mentioned the mantra of, that I think we should look at, which is what if, why not, are you sure? When I joined Macquarie, which is a big global financial firm headquartered in Australia, but a lot of our operations are out of London, we're the biggest infrastructure asset manager in the world um, and one of the biggest renewable developers in the world as well. Um, and I saw this written on the walls everywhere. What, so what, now what? And I thought, well, that's really good. It's very pragmatic, ruthlessly commercial, as you'd expect. Um, but we preface that with what if, why not, are you sure? What if a fundamental breakthrough in a lab that we're looking at happens? What if a policy change you know, that we think could happen happens? What if a business model innovation works that nobody really thought of? What if the sentiment of a younger generation really gives a damn about climate change? The why not is explain the first principles physics to me. Why can't that happen? What are the immutable laws of economics that say this is impossible? You know, what, what is the, the regulatory impossibility that this could never happen? And then even if you think it with all you sure, and keep asking that question, being a bit of, devil, of a devil's advocate, sure, pain in the arse, right? Because what you'll see over time is asking those questions would have saved an awful lot of people a lot of money and a lot of headache by not seeing these, these trends. So we, as a group, we're sort of like an in-house think tank. I hate to use that term, the term people use thought leadership, it's stupid, but um, you know, thought leadership. We effectively look at something like 120 different technologies, largely in energy and transport industry, but also telecommunications, automation, robotics, biotech, that sort of thing. We then produce a bunch of research that helps form or inform or challenge the house view that we have as a firm. And then we use that across our value chain. And our value chain is we raise money from pension funds primarily, but also sovereign wealth funds and insurance companies. We invest that money into infrastructure assets, either new green fields that we build or existing assets. And then we manage those assets for a decade or so, you know, hoping we add value to them, make them better, faster, cleaner, et cetera. And then eventually we sell those and that's how we pay the investors and, and your pension funds if and when you ever have a pension. Um, so we look, I mentioned we looked at lots of different tech, don't worry about it. Okay, so a little bit about how we think. So first of all, is, has anybody ever heard of the hype cycle from Gartner? There's a few nods, great. So Gartner is sort of a data analytics firm that for those of you who might know Bloomberg or Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Gartner's kind of the data equivalent of, of BNEF, right? And Gartner publishes this thing called the hype cycle every year where they map technologies against it. It's meant to be somewhat tongue in cheek, but there's a lot to this. It's one of the things that a lot of venture capitalists and startup entrepreneurs get wrong, is they misunderstand this natural journey that technologies or some business models go through, but especially technology. Um, you have to look out for these peak inflated expectations. What often happens is somebody in the lab, you know, around the corner of the chemistry department or something comes up with an idea, they publish a paper, a journalist who kind of crosses between academia and, and general media gets a hold of it, they then say a story, and you can read any major broadsheet newspaper or website in the world, and you'll hear a story every week about a breakthrough battery. The future of electric mobility is, or we're going to have flying cars, or we're all going to be you know, using scramjet engines, or hydrogen is going to solve all the world's problems tomorrow. That's the peak of inflated expectations, where what tends to happen is there's a, a trigger, you get this hype that goes, and then eventually people realize, well, this is going to take a lot longer than I thought. And then eventually over time is where you start getting the real applications of these. Timing that if you're a venture capitalist is really important. We are not venture capitalists per se, we're long-term investors, so we sort of look beyond just that hype. We're not trying to buy something and sell it six months later. Um, another thing is a topic, the talk of the topic I did for one of the MSC programs is this, evolution versus disruption versus revolution. Some of the most over -word, overused words in business English are disruption and revolution. There are very few technologies in human history that are genuinely revolutionary. One could argue smartphones might be there, but they're certainly at least disruptive. The World Wide Web, the internet was disrupted. The World Wide Web was probably revolutionary, right? The airplane was revolutionary. There, there haven't been that many things that have genuinely been revolutionary. They do exist, but evolutionary improvements of what we're talking about are really, really profound. And people underestimate the power of evolutionary improvement to their peril, right? And we'll talk about why that is. So. As an example, uh, Mohammed and my, my old friend here, when we work together in Saudi Arabia, will recognize it so you're not allowed to answer. Does anybody know what this It is a solar panel, we'll give that away. Any idea how old it is? What's that? Okay. Not a million miles away, but 1979, right? So in, uh, in Saudi, when we worked at Aramco helping sort of be agent provocateurs for renewables in the kingdom, 
and people kept telling us that, well, renewables can't work here, and we have this grocery list of reasons why that can't possibly work. From behind the podium, we pull these out and say, well, this is one that Saudi Aramco has been using since 1980, uh, and it still works. And they've been running cathodic protection on pipelines, left it out in the Arabian desert for 40 years in one of the world's most harsh climates, and they still work. Now, the key thing here is that this is an evolutionary improvement. This essentially is the same technology as brand new solar panel today. It's 100 times or 100 times less efficient than a solar panel today. It probably would have cost about 1,000 times per unit of power generation. But it's essentially the same technology. What we've had years it's called Wright's Law in economics, the learning curve effect in manufacturing, is a steady compound improvement in this technology. And as Einstein once said, you know, one of the greatest forces in the universe is compounding interest, but it's also compounding improvement in the tech. Um, I mentioned these what-if questions we ask. Our team is called Tech and Innovation for a reason. It's not just tech. Technoeconomics, the improvement in, that tech, in the technology people get, that could be evolutionary to revolutionary. But don't forget regulation. Don't forget business model. And don't forget the consumer. In the energy world, and certainly in a financial world, a lot of people would say, oh, you know, innovation and disruption of regulation, you know, innovators don't regulate. That's not correct, right? We don't have a global power market, competitive power markets, without PURPA legislation in America in the 1980s. We don't have the global renewables industry without the energy then the, the energy transition in Germany in the late, two, late 90s, early 2000s. We don't <coughs> have electric vehicles today without the California Air Resources Board in the late 90s and early 2000s. Right? Um, carbon pricing, net zero commitments, you know, re renewable portfolio standards. The, the nuclear industry in France doesn't happen without the, the regulator deciding we want to do this, right? So regulation is absolutely a key part of this. And, and you, can't dis you can't separate the private sector and the public sector for this. One, neither one can do it on their own. They have to do this together. Um, business models most people get, those can be really innovative. Um, power purchase agreements and all sorts of other things. The as-a-service model, many of you would be familiar with on various areas. And then consumer demand, we're seeing that with a real generational shift. And most of your generation, some of us are a bit older, but you know, the younger generation of people in this room there is a fundamental shift around much of the world. The demographic data shows that as well. So that's a bit about sort of how we think, a little bit about how we would apply this. So don't worry how complicated this chart looks. But what you're looking on the vertical axis is sort of the, the um, likelihood of something happening by 2030 versus the impact of that thing happening by 2030. And then what we start doing, and we can and do debate you know, always, where, where would you sort of plot these on a graph at any time or on a chart at any time? So if I take a few examples, PV stands for photovoltaic solar power. PPAs is power purchase agreement. And I said, you know, I think there's a high probability that in the Sun Belt of the world, $10 per megawatt hour, which is one US cent kilowatt hour by 2030. I first showed this in the year 2017 in Oxford to a bunch of Oxford dons, and I said $20 a megawatt hour, and I was told that's insane. Right? Now in the kingdom, later that year, we awarded our first PV PPA in the country at less than $20 a megawatt hour in 2017. So I don't think it's a pretty revolutionary idea that you know getting to $10 a megawatt hour has a high likelihood of happening. Oh, it has already happened. Right? Yeah, I was going to say, we've now actually had it, right? You know, so it's, it's, it's kind of a given people debate, is it real, is it not real, all that. But you know, we, we sort of, I think we'll be there, and that will be the norm across the sun, though, in my view. But notice I don't put it too far in the PV only can penetrate just the power sector, and the power sector is only in this portion of the economy, and on its own, it can only work when the sun shines, so it can only represent this slither, uh, this, you know, uh, of, of the world energy economy, or the world economy. So we go over to the right, and we say electric vehicle batteries getting to this price target of $65 a kilowatt hour. The reason I picked that number is, it's because that's where you're at, essentially, you're below unsubsidized purchase price parity, meaning an electric vehicle that does 500 kilometers per charge, you know, a range would cost less to buy than its internal combustion engine equivalent without any subsidy whatsoever, and ignores all the environmental benefits, and it ignores the lower running cost, right? So the impact of that, I think, is, is quite profound. We can think about electrolyzers becoming 10x cheaper. We can think about you know, small modular nuclear reactors, and, you know, how likely is it that they're going to be competitive and where and what those impacts would be. The takeaway from this is that any one of these things you can plot on a chart and on its get your prediction wrong because you have to think about how these things feed on each other, right? And the, the likelihood of one thing can increase the likelihood and or the impact of another thing when taken in totality. Or conversely, they can decrease the likelihood of something happening, right? If we do somehow, something has a real breakthrough and we get small modular nuclear reactors which can't be weaponized and 
don't have to worry about accidents and we don't have to worry about waste and et cetera. And they really can come in at, you know, whatever price we put on there, you know, less than $50 a megawatt hour, we might slow down the deployment of other technologies, right? So, you know, th those things are, are true. And always ask yourself, what has to be true for me to be wrong? That's a fundamental question anybody should ever ask, not just in academia and in research, but certainly in forecasting and investing in others. So we think about how all these feed on each other. So let me give you an example of how this can work. Yeah, sorry, this question. Oh, I was just really yeah. curious. Is AV, was that automated vehicles? Autonomous vehicles, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when, when, for example, when I joined Macquarie in 2018, I just finished my exec MBA here at Oxford, um, and I started my, um, my, my job at Macquarie. And when I first came in, one of the technologies everybody wanted to know about were self-driving cars, autonomous yeah. vehicles. And the hype in 2018, the hype cycle, we were reaching the peak of inflated expectations. Everybody thought, well, these things are going to be here because all the media was telling you, we're going to have fleets of robo-taxis by 2021. Guess what year it is? Have any of you been riding around in fleets of robo-taxis? I've ridden in a few of them in, in California and Phoenix. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not going to be you know, prolific anytime soon. And actually, interestingly, I was with a bunch of other graduate students here at Oxford who were doing a lot of the, the detailed engineering, computer science, buying a lot of this stuff, and they were all going, we're nowhere near it. Right? It was, it was sitting with them on the first principles physics side going, don't believe the bullshit, this is not real, you know, and I had them sort of explaining this to me, you know, at Worcester College, you know, at the common room in the evening. Um, so when I joined, everybody thought this would be a real thing, and one of the things we said is we don't actually believe that. We think it would be consequential if and when, I think it is when, they do really proliferate, but I don't see it happening in anything. We made where we said, you know, we don't see this kind of, you know, upper, bottom left, to upper right growth now. We will eventually see that S curve of growth, but we didn't see it happening anytime soon. But so, yeah, those are the kinds, some of the kind of black swan technologies we look at. So if we think about an example of how this feedback loop happens, imagine all the different driving forces for governments to push for zero emission electricity, electrically powered vehicles, right? ZEVs. So you end up with climate change, local air quality, energy security, industrial strategy. These are the reasons that countries want to push for electric vehicles. It's not just about climate, right? But then you say, okay, so they, they say we want this, so they give some regulation, that supports demand is normally how this is played out. So an incentive for buying an electric vehicle, for owning an electric vehicle, or a subsidy for its use, right? With that, you get a growth in the technology and people start saying, okay, well, we'll invest a little bit more and people start making an EV production. As production comes, you get more uh, scale. With more scale, you get lower prices. With lower prices and improved economics, you get more demand and you start this positive feedback loop, right? And that sounds great. And you can see them coming down the cost curve and, you know, batteries have come down in price 85% or so in the last 10 or 12 years, right? Electric vehicle batteries. Um, so it's been really, really a profound cost decline. What eventually happens, and this was our prediction in 2018, was we said, this dynamic is going to lead from, we really want you to from regulators, to we're going to keep getting more and more incentives because we can see what we want to happen happening and accelerating, to eventually they're going to remember they can say that shout. And they're going to say, you must drive on zero emission vehicles. And especially when they're looking at tandem saying we're decarbonizing our power grid, which the UK has done an amazing job of over the last 10 or 12 years. For those who don't know the numbers, it's worth looking at just how much cleaner the grid is now than it was 10 years ago. It's probably the biggest improvement in the world. Um, we could look at that and say, well, we see the grid getting cleaner. We see the cost of these cars, which drive on that ever cleaning grid, getting cheaper and cheaper. That's a real positive feedback loop. And it improves air quality and we can get some industrial backing on the back of it, right? So we see this feedback loop happening more and more. Um, so what we think, we'll talk a little bit about electricity and then a bit beyond electricity. So I'm a geek and I actually keep a framed copy of a PowerPoint slide that I saw as a young graduate at Shell or not so young graduate at Shell back about 2004 or five, right? And I was in the aviation business. I was an airline fuel buyer and a jet fuel trader and a supply manager. And I remember seeing this at a lunch and learn presentation, not being an engineer by background. And it showed how big the solar farm would be to power the United States using 2000 and I think three or four technology, right? And I remember the first question I asked is, is that true? I don't know how to calculate if that's true. If it is true, I don't know why we're not doing it. it probably has something to do with money. I need to know more about money, you know? And then eventually as I, I sort of satisfied myself with those questions over the next few kind of days, weeks, months, voracious reading, talking to experts, talking to various people, and I realized, oh, there's a lot of reasons we're not doing it. It's profoundly expensive, you know, it's not yet efficient, blah, blah, blah. but once I convinced myself that it could work and I could see a pathway, that is what I knew I wanted to essentially do with the rest of my career. It took me a while to get there. And I had to make lots of shifts along the way, but eventually kind of said, that's what I want to do. And, and actually my original driver for this wasn't necessarily climate change. I've cared about climate change since the 90s, 
but it wasn't my main driver. It was mainly energy security and it was geopolitics. And at the time, I had a lot of friends of mine in the U.S. who were fighting wars in the Middle East over oil. I had, you know, we were parity. The U.S. was importing half a trillion dollars a year worth of oil, Europe even more. Um, you know, I could look at this and say, this is a real problem. Clean tech to me is a way to solve a lot of these. Not necessarily the only single solution, but it's one of the ways to address a lot of those. And that's where I originally came to this. So, when I, and, you know, you start looking at that and saying, well, that's true in the U.S., but what about the rest of the world? Many of you would have seen studies like this before. You know, the big yellow dot effectively is the amount of solar energy that reaches the surface of the land of the world and every year. And you compare that to the amount of energy we have in total proven reserves of uranium, coal, gas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what you see is the solar resource is many thousands of times greater than this little dot up there in the upper left corner, which is the 2015 total primary energy demand of humanity all the coal, gas, oil, hydro, biomass, wind, solar, uranium, et cetera, right? So many, many, many times greater. But the question is always, wouldn't you have to cover the world to capture that power? Um, the answer is obviously no, and you're not going to be surprised to hear me say that. When I moved to Saudi, one of the first things I did was that same kind of calculation for the kingdom. And myself and, a, and another colleague of mine there who now works with me at the quarry, uh, we did this calculation, and the dark blue dot you see here is 100% of Saudi Arabia's electricity uh, from solar. The big blue square is 100% of the world's electricity from solar. And this, again, is in 2013's efficiency, which is quite a bit less efficient than they are today. So that space has shrunk since then. And this dotted sort of square is uh, powering the kingdom with wind. Now, it's worth noting that that's the area between all the turbines included. Obviously, you're not using, quote unquote, using that land. The actual footprint of the turbines themselves would fit in the back nine of the golf course at around close headquarters. So, you know, the actual physical land used up is not a lot. Um, and then when I moved to Macquarie, uh, same kind of question. It's an Australian company. I mentioned that to someone. They said, oh, really? What would that look like in Oz? So square is now. We have small dot, Australia's electricity demand. Next smallest dot, or next biggest dot, is Australia's primary energy, which includes making molecules. So replacing all the coal, the oil, and the gas and with uh, green hydrogen. The next dark green square is 100% of the world's electricity. And the big square is 100% of the world's primary energy, meaning all the coal, gas, oil, biomass, uranium, hydro, wind, solar, et cetera, uh, including the conversions over with, with hydrogen and those losses, right? That is about half a percent, 0.6. So put that in perspective, you compare that to a country in the UK where we've already paved over in roads two, three, four percent of the land area. A lot of this can be dual use of land. It's not all ground mounted. Just the first principles you can look at and say, okay, land is not the constraining factor. Resources is a constraining factor. Land's not the constraining factor. And of course, when you show this in the kingdom or you show this in Australia, people say, we're going to become the Saudi Arabia of solar, the Saudi Arabia, you know, Australia's going to be Saudi Arabia, whatever, except that that's not really true because China can do the same thing. Uh, the United States can do the same thing. UK, not so much. Um, you know, we don't have as much solar resources as you might imagine, but we still have a hell of a lot of potential, right? There's still rooftops alone in the, in the UK, in this kingdom, uh, can give you probably 100 gigawatts or so uh, of rooftop solar, right? Government's own numbers. Uh, but what we do have in this country is a lot of wind, especially offshore wind. So we put this the calculation together a few years ago for the Scottish Energy Minister and said, you know, if, if obviously we can generate there, but even if you wanted to start making uh, uh, molecules out of it and you wanted to replace natural gas, we did this as a bookend simplistic calculation. The smaller square is all the natural gas that we use for residential heating, domestic heating in the UK, um, replaced with green hydrogen need about 100 gigawatts or so, depending on one's assumptions. Um, and if you want to replace all the natural gas we use in the UK with green hydrogen, you need about 300, 298 gigawatts or something based on a, I think it's 50% capacity factor, which of course you wouldn't do that because a lot of that goes for power generation and you wouldn't need all that natural gas for power generation if you had that much wind in the first place, right? But it was just a bookend to help people understand that. And then you start thinking about seasonal variability and how does the wind match the load? And it, a simplistic chart over 13 years, it looks like it's a pretty good match, except that if you look closely at that chart, you still see that there's disjoints weeks at a time, right? So energy storage comes in and you have to think about how do you store that? Now, when we talk about all this land available that I just said, oh, it's great, right? We have all this land. Well, if we think about the square meters per capita, that varies a lot by country around the world, right? If you're Singapore, if you're Belgium, if you're Luxembourg, if you're Taiwan or South Korea, that's a really different story than if you're Australia. Right? So there are certain countries in the world that have a lot more space available to them 
to do things that are land heavy, right? Um, so that creates a need for clean energy trade. So how do we move electrons around or how do we move this energy around? Well, we move it on wires, so high voltage direct current lines, or we have to turn it into a molecule or into something else and figure out a way to transport that energy. Examples can be shipping, you know, eventually liquefied hydrogen, maybe. Open question how well the cryogenics can improve. We know that we can ship uh, hydrogen in pipelines because we already do it. Um, and we know that we can ship ammonia around because we already ship ammonia. And ammonia is just nitrogen and hydrogen put together. So <coughs> people are already looking at that as a vector to move hydrogen around. The question is whether or not anybody will ever start taking that hydrogen or that ammonia, cracking it on the other end to get the hydrogen out. And I'll show why that might not be the case. But there's a lot of demand for ammonia around the world and a lot of potential incremental demand for ammonia that can go into power generation and shipping fuels and others, right? Um, so some other examples um, that you can see at a European level or at a MIA level, uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, or North Africa at least, the square and the big square in the bottom here is 100% of Europe's primary energy. Um, many of those, all of us who are, say, 40 years and older, probably 20 or so years ago, how we're going to build all the stuff in the North African deserts and put cables across the Mediterranean, and that hasn't happened. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons that hasn't happened. Part of it is because it just became so damn cheap that it used to be if, let's say, this used to cost $100 a megawatt hour solar in North Africa, that meant up in the UK it was three or $400 a megawatt hour. Well, when that's one, $10 a megawatt hour, that's only 30 or $40 a megawatt hour. So the transportation distance or the transportation cost becomes a huge percentage of people trying to build a cable from here to the UK directly. And there already are a few interconnects that are being built. But one of the things we put as an example here is, well, if you wanted to move hydrogen around, um, so if you wanted to use solar to generate green hydrogen, green hydrogen, if you don't know the term, is simply taking hot water, H2O, using electrolysis, most of you remember from sort of grade school chemistry, running a current through and splitting it apart and making H2NO or O2, right? These little dashed lines that we put in are pipelines, hypothetical pipelines from hypothetical solar farms, which individually would produce 50, 15, 15, million tons of green hydrogen per annum. Okay, is that a lot? Well, up there in the upper right is the Nord Stream pipeline that many of you might have read in the press recently. Most likely, we think the Russians are the ones who just blew it up, the Russian pipeline. That carries 60, 60 gigawatts of thermal energy, right? It's a huge amount of energy you can move in a pipeline versus a power line. And the subsea component of that pipeline that was under the Baltic that just got blown up, um, that's how far that same distance gets you into continental Europe. So the idea that you could say, well, you know, would we ever really be so reliant on buying gray molecules from Morocco or Tunisia or whatever? Well, we already buy gray molecules from them. We have pipelines buying natural gas. So why is buying hydrogen such a radical idea? And we've been buying lots and lots of gas from Russia for the last, you know, decades, and that hasn't panned out particularly well. So if you want to diversify your supply and have a low carbon option, there are at least options, right? Um, so what's the outlook? So a couple of things I'd look at and you left, Mohammed, because you would have recognized some of these. There is a long-standing trend in the solar industry. Uh, this dark line here is the growth in actual, what actually gets deployed every year. And this may not look like a big deal because of the scale of the chart. But to put it in perspective, the year 2006 is the first data point I put on here. Does anybody know what happened in 2006? Why that would be the first data point? The first year that we ever installed one gigawatt per annum of solar, right? We had gone from a, set, a few megawatts in the 90s, and we got up to a, a gigawatt. What's a gigawatt? Anybody know? A thousand megawatts. thousand megawatts. So the first one gigawatt, i.e. roughly the size of a coal plant or a nuke, was installed in 2006. 2017, we had 100 gigawatts. That's 100x growth over an 11-year period. Now, the estimates for this year, 2022 is somewhere between 250 and 300 gigawatts. And what you see is even as these predictions were being made saying 2015, this was the IEA's estimate, the International Energy Agency, there are three scenarios. They thought all the way up to the year 2040, we would be installing about 60, 70 gigawatts in a bullish scenario. And it's kind of, you know, they have been revising this over time, but they haven't been very accurate. If we take Bloomberg or we take, or we take others, right? Over time, you know, theirs at least are going linearly up but none of them were compounding, none of them were exponential, they were all linear. What we've seen over time though, and back in, in 2015, myself and some colleagues asked us what if, why not, pretty short question. What we said is, well, if solar gets really cheap, wouldn't we expect its growth to accelerate, not decelerate? 
as it becomes the cheapest form of energy because resources are a limiting factor, land is not a limiting factor, and making it isn't that hard, right? We know how to manufacture this stuff, it's silicon, like we can do semiconductors. So we just started drawing these what-if scenarios. And we simply said, well, what if we continue growing on a compounding exponential basis to grow asymptotically, so you never quite reach it, but you go on an S-curve, up to 1,000 gigawatts a year, a terawatt, two terawatts a year, five terawatts a year. Does anybody know what the installed power generation capacity of China is? Orders of magnitude? You look like you have a guess. You want to guess? Two terawatts. Two terawatts, exactly, right? So China's total installed capacity, all this power generation, is two terawatts. <laughs> We made a what-if scenario. They said, what if we install five terawatts per annum, right? And that might sound like it's absolutely batshit crazy, and it kind of is, right? Like, it wasn't a prediction. But we wanted to understand, well, why not? And if you did do that, well, you wouldn't just be generating electrons. You would be powering vehicles. You would be powering heat. You would be making molecules for industry. You would be doing all sorts of other things. But we simply just ran those numbers and just said, oh, what would that imply on the cost? Well, what it would imply is, you know, whatever, it's worth noting that we're pretty close to that five terawatt curve seven years later. We're certainly above the two terawatt curve. And now, for the first time ever in the last two years, Bloomberg and others, these dark lines that you see, are now running scenarios that get up to a terawatt a year. Not, not just hypothetical scenarios, you're saying, we think there's a pretty good chance that we're gonna get to a thousand gigawatts per annum. And if we're installing a thousand gigawatts up there at the top of the chart, and I had to cut the chart because otherwise it looks so ridiculous, a thousand gigawatts per annum means that is as much solar as we'd install in the we would install new each year, right? So it's taken us 40 years or more to install the first terawatt of solar this year, 2020, 2022, sorry, is when we reach the first cumulative terawatt. We'll do that in the next three. And then we might do that in, you know, one year after that, and then we might double that again, double that again. We have not yet begun to fight, <laughs> as it were, in terms of solar technology, solar efficiency, solar cost, in my personal view. Right? Um, so really, really fascinating outlook on that regard. And then what that means in terms of cost declines, this is from IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. You're looking at solar PV, concentrating solar thermal power, reflects sunlight, great heat, drive the steam turbine, onshore wind and offshore wind. And the gray bar is the fossil fuel range, the cost range, right? What you're seeing is that over the last 10 or 15 years, when governments, back to policy being important, have started stimulating these technologies, they've seen these profound cost reductions over time. And what governments, you hear this all the time now in the UK, vis-a-vis -vis hydrogen, right? Because we've seen that as we incentivize solar globally, the cost of this. As we incentivize onshore wind, it doesn't look that dramatic only because of the scale here, but that's a huge cost decline, right? In terms of percentage. And then offshore wind in a really short period, we went from really expensive to the cheapest form of energy anybody's ever had. The recent XPM, Boris Johnson noted a couple months back that offshore wind is now nine, at the time nine times cheaper than power from natural gas. He said, and he said, let me repeat, offshore wind, new offshore wind is nine times cheaper than the fuel going into a gas plant, right? So we are now looking at the cheapest form of energy humanity's ever had in the form of renewables. So we look at this and say, back to this ends up becoming a growth driver of the world energy economy in our view for a bunch of reasons. And we find it really, really fascinating. Now, where I spend a lot of my time and my team and my colleagues, we're spending a lot of time figuring out, you know, that these next generations of further with wind and solar and what are those things that we can do. Um, I'm conscious of time. So how, how long do we have? I think we're, are we almost at time or when do we go into? Uh, yeah, we've got um, quite a while. We do, yeah, okay, great. But if you want to take a break. No, no, I was going to say, if people want to get some food, there's pizza here and I don't want it to get cold. <laughs> The students in the room, you don't deny them pizza. Do <laughs> you guys want to grab some and we can keep going? You good? Okay. Well, we'll keep going. Pizza's here. If you change your mind, come up. I won't be offended. I was a student once too. All right. So what's driving these cost declines? Scale, scale, scale in terms of wind. To put this into perspective, this is the sort of evolution of the size of turbines over the years, right? Absolutely profound. For those of us who remember the 90s or the 80s or certainly the early 2000s, what we thought was a big turbine looks like a toy today, right? A new, this isn't even that big, this isn't the biggest turbine anymore. This is a, a GE 12 megawatt turbine, we're going up to 14 now. Um, you know, that's the Eiffel Tower. The tops of these now are above the Shard in London, if any of you have seen it, you know, tallest office buildings in Europe. These are big, giant machines. And there's a cube function, you know, engineers will understand it, but just getting bigger really helps drive down costs. 
for uh, wind, particularly offshore wind. Now, there are all kinds of radical new designs people have looked at for many, many years. Instead of horizontal axis turbines, vertical ones, you might see spinning this way instead of this way, with two blades instead of three, power kites that go high up into the atmosphere. Like All of these things are possible. Uh, none of them have really worked back to the evolutionary thing. One of the things that most investors or venture capitalists make this mistake over and over and over again is they underestimate the compounding improvements or the compounding evolutionary improvements of the existing technology. So we would hear all the time in previous roles, I hear in my current role, well, we have this new whiz-bang technology. It's a battery, it's a solar panel, it's a hydrogen electrolyzer, it's a wind turbine, it's a nuke, whatever. And we can be 50%. And I go, great. So what do you need to get 50% cheaper? Well, we need $5 billion. And then we need, you know, X number of years and we need to scale up and we need the first, you know, 13 iterations of the product, et cetera, et cetera. And we will be 50% cheaper. I go, yeah, but by that time, the existing technology is going to be 70% cheaper. So unless you genuinely have, as the expression goes, a better mousetrap, you have to have a really transformative improvement. So if any of you are, are trying to be startup entrepreneurs, or you're working on something in a lab and you think, I have this technology, it's going to be great. I'm happy to come and talk to you afterward, but like, be skeptical, right? Um, that's why most of these technologies, I don't care whether you're Oxford or MIT or Stanford or anyone else, um, most of the technologies come out of a lab don't scale for reasons, right? They're good foundational technical or techno-economic reasons. It's not because there's a grand conspiracy to keep people from having this technology work. It's because trying to compete with technologies that have decades and decades of scale and experience and learning by doing is really, really hard. And that's why I don't see venture capital as the secret sauce that we get a day of six machina you know, solution to the energy world. It's about deploying stuff we already know exists and we know how to do and scaling it and getting it better. Now with solar, it's a bit different. So scale is a big part of it. Technology is a huge part of it. And then technology, we have to break between the modules and the balance of the system. So with scale, you get financing and business models at levels that were unprecedented before. Technology is not just about but the modules themselves, the efficiency with which they convert sunlight, photons to electrons is wildly different than it was and wildly better than it was even 10 years ago, or certainly 20 years ago, and profoundly different than 30 years ago, right? So what that means is the amount of land that you need shrinks proportionally. The amount of cabling you need within this, these giant solar farms shrinks proportionally. The steel you need to put on to wrap all of these things drops. The concrete you need, the operation you need to put them in goes down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's where the efficiency and less material and things come in. But we also have all kinds of things, and I, I am the view that we're going to see huge reductions in the cost of deploying a lot of these technologies, even with existing tech, just because we've only just really started deploying it, right? You have a massive pre-assembly where you imagine machines are just coming out and, and effectively just bump, 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 putting in a solar farm in no time at all. It's already an incredibly fast thing compared to conventional power, thermal power, but it can be a lot faster still. And we see lots of really cool innovations out there doing it, let alone we might come up with solar power. We already know and Oxford PV is, is one that gets a lot of press. But there's lots of what's called thin film solar. You have a substrate, you effectively dope it with a chemical or a chemical mixture that is photovoltaic. And effectively, like what an old newspaper school would have been, we have these giant kind of you know, continuous processes, just spooling, plastic substrate being printed on there, 3D, or just printed on as, um, as a photovoltaic cell. You can imagine having giant spools of photovoltaics that you go out to a field and roll them out and plug them in, right? Like that, I know that sounds simplistic, it is simplistic. But that's kind of where we could imagine getting to. You're in a world that's really, really different in terms of if you want to deploy five terawatts a year, that's the kind of innovation you would need to have to get there. Um, what about energy storage? I mentioned, you know, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. Well aware of that. Um, despite what sometimes newspapers say, or you'll hear some troll online going, oh, well, you know, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always You know, and nor had all the other people working in this industry for 30, 40 years. That's amazing. I thought the sun was out right now. Um, so there's lots of different storage technologies, and they're used in different durations. And this is really key, because this is where the popular press and regulators often get really confused. We need energy storage in some cases at the really small scale, right? And, we're, and we need it at the really short duration. So there's power and energy, right? We're powering times time gives you energy. Some of it we need in short, small amounts of power. Some of it we need for huge amounts of power, but really short periods of time. And some, it's a combination of both. We need lots, lots amount of power for a long amount of time, right? Different technologies serve different purposes on this chart. And what you get an idea on the top scale is 
for what sorts of durations are we talking about? <coughs> Seconds versus minutes versus hours versus days versus months, right? So if you think about it with solar, we know the sun comes up and goes down every day. If the sun doesn't come up, we've got bigger problems, right? Now we can have a cloudy day, we can have a winter day, we can have all these sorts of things, but we know the sun's going to come up and we know within a range of, you know, snowy winter's day versus bright, sunny spring day in, in northern latitudes, we know what the range of that will be, give or take, right? Certain batteries for those are great for what's called diurnal storage within day. So when the sun comes up, you charge up a battery or some other storage device, you discharge it in the evening to sort of shift peak production from the middle of the day to match it with your peak demand of load in the evening, right? That's diurnal within hours. And batteries are, are getting there, right? We're, we're pretty close in many markets around the world where solar plus batteries start to become an economic solution. Um, I, we just bought a house in, in London that we're renovating. I've been living in a flat for many, many years, for decades, but I have now have my own roof. I'm really excited. I finally get to have solar panels on at the time when everybody in the world is now trying to put solar panels on. So I'm still waiting months and months and months. Whereas before this used to be like a two week process. Now it's six months to year because everybody's sold out. There's so much demand. But we're looking at the economic and going, wow, the difference between peak and off-peak prices is so huge that even without solar, we just might sell better. I actually toyed with buying a used Nissan Leaf, an old electric vehicle, and just using the Leaf as a battery so I can charge it at night and then run my house on it during the day um, because the prices are so huge, right? Um, I know that sounds crazy, but it almost pencils out. Um, then there's all sorts of other storage, right? There's, there's electrochemical storage, which are batteries, and many of you who are chemists or physicists might be working on these. There's thermal energy storage. Thermodynamics, the idea of taking good quality electrons, turning it to heat, and then turning that back into electricity, but it still might pencil out if it's, the power is cheap enough and you need it, right? Or you might create heat with clean electrons and use that heat in industrial or other commercial processes. Then we have much longer duration storage for things like pumped hydro storage, which we have a lot of in Norway and Switzerland, in the northwest of the US and Quebec, that kind of thing. Where you take water, when you have that surplus electricity, you pump it up a hill into a higher reservoir, and when you need that energy back again as electrons, it comes down a sluice gate, where you open up the gate, it drives a hydro turbine, creates electricity, right? That, that is the bulk of global energy storage today. And where you have pumped hydro, we can have pumped hydro, it's great. The problem is you can't put it everywhere, right? So there's all these other kinds of pros and cons of different storage technologies. And ultimately, there's hydrogen, which again is the idea of taking that clean electron, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, keeping that hydrogen, which can be turned back into power or heat or for industrial chemical growth either in a turbine and or in a fuel cell. And we think of the energy transition in the power sector in three phases, right? So where we've been to now, to date, roughly now, around the world is, we've deployed renewables because they were first subsidized, and now that they're becoming cheap, they're becoming cheaper than the running cost of a conventional power plant, meaning a new built solar or wind farm can cost less than just the fuel going into a fully depreciated gas plant or coal plant. So when you do that, the economically rational thing is at a system level, you want to deploy as much renewables as you can, or as many gigawatts of renewables as you can to save fuel. It's like a negative ton of coal, a negative barrel of oil, a negative BTU of gas, right? Or a megawatt hour of gas. But eventually you hit a point where the capacity to generate reaches and starts to exceed your demand for power at any moment in time. So you start curtailing or wasting, a nice word for wasting, turning off some of that electricity. And that's where the second phase of energy transition comes in or electrical energy transition. You start having storage. You don't have that much surplus capacity that often. It'll be within day, et cetera. And in many markets around the world, we did this as a hypothetical, you know, solar plus wind plus batteries in Australia and the Southern US, certainly in the Middle East and elsewhere, you can run economies essentially on solar, wind and batteries because there's always enough sun and in some places always enough wind that you're really not too worried about it. Batteries can do it, and that would be enough. You might keep some thermal generation as backup uh, for whatever reason, but the resource is so great that you can get away with it. Yeah, please. Is that batteries today? Yeah, with today's batteries, you can do that, right? I mean, you can use batteries for long duration storage. You can charge up your phone today, stick it in, you know, put it in an airplane mode, stick it in a drawer, come back in six months, and it still has power in it. But you would never do that economically, right? You, you, that would just be nuts. You have to amortize that fixed cost of the battery over more and more units. So you want to cycle it more and more because the battery is expensive. Now, in order to economically store energy in other markets where you have huge seasonal variation like the UK, we can't power the UK on solar in the winter, right? As we can all see if we look out the window. Um, even with wind, you know, wind, it's windier in the winter than it is in the summer, and that's great. That's our peak electricity demand is in the winter, and that's only going to increase. 
but we have weeks at a time with the Germans called Dunkelflotte, or the dark doldrums, which are these periods of no wind, no sun, and it's really cold, right? So the exact peak time when you need the most energy at the societal level is when we don't have wind and we don't have sun. And you have to think, well, how do I store that? And that's what make doing things like either pump hydro storage if you have it, hydrogen if we you know if we can make it, <coughs> which I think we can over time, or maybe some new chemistries, new energy storage technologies, etc. That lots of people are working on, and we spend a lot of time looking at. But what interconnectors. Yeah, interconnectors are part of that, but every at some point somebody's got to balance that out, right? And what's worth, what's worth noting is people say, well, this is why we need nuclear. No, it's not. So nuclear, and I'll come on to dispatchable versus baseload. Nuclear has this problem in front. Of Essentially, overbuilt nuclear. I think it might even be the next slide. Let me have a look. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, so, this intermittency that sun shines, wind blows, etc., is a feature, not a bug, of how renewables work. You're going to hear this term, term if you don't hear it now in the energy world all the time. Baseload, baseload, baseload. We need baseload. What is baseload? Can someone give me a definition? What's that? It's really power. It goes consistently all the time. The definition of baseload is actually the minimum load that you ever reach. So if you imagine your, your, your demand looks like this, you have a base load here, over the, let's say this is a year's worth of generation, right. would be that, right? It would be that level. That at any, there is at least that amount of base load on the grid at an moment time, right? Now what you find in most markets around the world is there's huge variations seasonally between summer, winter, et cetera, et cetera, day, you know, weekends, weekends versus weekdays, holidays, et cetera. So in many countries, it might be the actual base load might be only 25% of peak demand. And that's all base load means, is it needs to be on all the time. I would argue we don't need base load. What we need is dispatchable, firm power generation, and preferably clean. If we want to get to net zero, it's got to be clean. So nuclear can theoretically do that. You can turn a nuke on and off again. But back to my battery example, you wouldn't want to. It's so capital intensive that you want to run it as much as you possibly can to bring the unit price down. And even if we run it 24-7, it's still really expensive. So in France, they have about 70% or so of their electricity comes from nuclear. But one of the reasons they're able to do that is because, to your point, they're so well interconnected. And they're connected to places like Switzerland and Spain and elsewhere where they have pumped hydro, or they have fossil fuels or other renewables that they effectively swap for. It. So they overproduce nuclear in the middle of the night, and they're exporting that to other people, like us, by the interconnector between the UK and France, a few gigawatts of that. And then they're buying power back in the middle of the day when they're hitting the peaks, because you're never going to build a nuclear power generator for the peak. So even if you wanted a 100% nuclear system, which, okay, like fair enough, like we can consider that, but you're still going to need storage. If everyone in Europe ran only on nuclear, you're either going to have so much surplus capacity as to be mind-blowing, or you're going to have to be able to have some combination of storage of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and if you think about it, this idea of why we don't need base power generation, the 24-7 power, is that more and more, this is actually from South Australia, I think. Yeah. Um, we're starting to get periods now, and Greece just had this last where 100% of the country is running only on renewables, and in this case, only on solar. And most of that was rooftop solar. Right? Got so you, what's that? Got yeah. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. So, where, where in Aussie are you from? Um, I've been working in Sydney, but they just released uh, like two weeks ago that they're getting rid of their gas and they're going inertia based completely yeah. in South Australia. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, South Australia is actually probably the highest single penetration of a relatively islanded system. It is one of those things that we watch, not just because we're an Australian company, but we watch really closely. We used to watch it together in Saudi going, watch that. And you keep saying it can't happen. It's only, it can only happen in Denmark where you're you know, connected every which way. Like, well, that which exists is by definition possible. And look at South Australia, look at Spain and Portugal, look at a few other islands, that sort of thing. This is going to happen more and more. And you start getting complementarity of you know wind in the, windier in the evening, sunnier during the day, all that sort of thing. But that combination of renewables means that what you really need is firm demand or firm power generation somewhere. And that can come from a mixture of batteries, from pumped hydro, from maybe gas with carbon capture, it might come from geothermal power, it might come from waste, it might come from nuclear. You know, There's a whole panoply of things. A lot of what I've talked about tonight is a bookend solution that's saying, well, what if we were only wind and solar? We're not going to likely be only wind and solar because you're going to have all these other options available to you as well. But you could be only wind and solar. And that to me is, is the exciting thing that says, we know that there are solutions to decarbonizing the power sector with technology we already have today, right? And certainly it gets cheaper and more affordable over time, but we can see where that goes. Um, why else storage? So it's not, you mentioned inertia, right? So it's not just 
about moving power from peak supply to peak demand and matching those. You have all these other reasons, right? So there's things like ramping, there's peak shaving, there's network deferments. We're seeing this more and more. An idea that was haram in Arabic forbidden many years ago. When we used to say that we're going to have batteries as a deferment for grid upgrades, people looked at us like we had five heads and said, this is crazy. Nobody's ever going to do that. What are you talking about? Now that's exactly what people are using batteries for. And while there's grid congestion, where we could oversize the grid and build a new transmission line, ooh, that's really expensive. That takes a long time. Hey, a battery's a lot cheaper. If we can just go and deploy a Tesla power pack system or you know some other battery developer, BYD or whatever, and we can get that built. And so that you know for those few hours of the day when that grid is congested, we can just make sure that's charging at a surplus capacity in the middle of the night, and that's generating or that's providing the power somewhere else. We're seeing that with EV charging now. So we do a lot of high power EV charging at some of our some of our portfolio companies around the world. Like I should have said, by the way, we own we bought the UK Green Investment Bank in 2017, which is now the Green Investment Group where I work. We own much of the UK's offshore wind. We own conventional power generation all around the world. We own ports. We own airports, telecom companies. We own farms. We own data centers. We own commercial real estate. Um, we own chemical hydrogen production facilities, energy storage, electric vehicle charging, like kind of anything you can think of in the physical real assets world, we, we own somewhere in the world. Um, we, in some of our places where we have high power EV charging, we're looking at saying, well, the grid connection is the limit. So what we're looking at is saying, well, let's use batteries as a buffer. It can be cheaper for us to build a battery system than it can to, than to upgrade our connection to the grid, which is right there. It's not like we're building a 500 kilometer transmission line. We're saying, the grid's right there, but the amount of time it'll take and the cost that to do that, and the cost to do it, a battery might be cheaper. And that's an amazing thing that people, you know, if you would have said that 10 years ago, would have thought insane. Now, inertia is something you mentioned. You can do what's called synthetic inertia with a battery. Um, but there is, you know, there is still some concerns over time, do you need rotating inertia? And there's all kinds of other energy storage technologies, which are thermal or, or other chemical and mechanical that we're looking at that aren't batteries that do provide physical inertia on a system as well. So again, it's not that it can't be done and that we have to have a gas plant or a coal plant or a nuke running in the background. We don't. And there are lots of other forms of energy storage that can now provide inertia as well, which is really exciting. Um, and again, I mentioned before battery costs coming down. This is the levelized cost of energy from store, or levelized cost of storage over the last, whatever it is, uh, 12 years or so, right? Um, and we think that goes down over time. Now, it has gone back up in the last year because they, they just given the price of everything going bottle supply chain bottlenecks and an incredible increase in demand in electric vehicle demand primarily is driving this um, you know 50 60 100 percent CAGR you know a year on year means that everybody's scrambling to get all the metals they can My, and so what we've seen is that battery storage projects we're doing around the world have increased in cost by about 30 percent but again the value of those projects have actually gone up because the volatility in the power markets now is so great that the value of the battery is more than increased by 30 percent the one thing i know too is that our expectation and it's not a, you know, don't invest on this basis, all my usual disclaimers kind of thing. But our expectation is that much like we saw in solar back in 2008, we had a, a cost decline that looked like this for decades, decades, decades. 2008 was around the time when global demand really started growing. And we reached beyond, we reached the limits of manufacturing capacity that we had in the world. So there was a real squeeze in the price of polysilicon and input into a solar panel. For about two or three years, the price of solar panels went up. And a lot of people said, oh, that's it. That's the end of the, you know, the incredible cost of in solar. We're now you know, 11, 12, 13x cheaper than that because we simply ramped up more manufacturing capacity. My expectation on things like lithium, cobalt, manganese, copper, et cetera, is that we're just going to be you know, opening up more mines. We're going to be opening up more processing facilities to refine those ores into minerals and finally into the metals that we need. Um, and so we expect that battery costs will continue to come down in the long run over time. So just a house view. So that will be global or concentrated in particular regions like China? Well, it's interesting. So has anybody heard that China has all the rare earths in the world? Yes. Yeah. And, and that you know, China has all this stuff? Well, not entirely true. They're not that rare. Well, yeah, exactly. That was a great comment for anyone who didn't hear it or online. They're not that rare, right? There's more than enough lithium in the world. There's more than enough nickel in the world. There's more than enough all these other things. The other thing is that China doesn't actually have these metals. China imports these ores from other places like Australia or Chile or Bolivia or, you know, what they have kind of cornered the market on is refining processing capacity. And it's simply because they were willing to pay for it and willing to build it. And then they created all the industry and the ecosystem around it. 
what you are seeing is a big trend around the world. It's you might have heard uh, in the past years that people talk about the sort of the D's of decarbonization, digitalization, um, you know, demographic switch, etc. Another one to add that uh, to that is maybe decentralization, deglobalization, right? Is one, um, which is because of what happened during COVID and now what's happening with the war in Ukraine, more and more governments around the world are going, okay, look, we're just not going to be so dependent anymore on external countries for core things that we need to run our society, not even purely economics, but our society. Batteries are going to become one of those. I, I use the term energy transition metals. I think the energy transition metal space is one of the most exciting areas from an investment point of view and just from a, an intellectual point of view. And, um, you know, that is looking at what all these, all these minerals will be. The, the other thing that one often hears is that we're going to have to dig up the planet. I, I don't think I have it in this presentation, but I can kind of walk you through the, the, the example that I've done, which is if I take Bloomberg's outlook, their most bullish net zero outlook to 2050, where they assume every light duty passenger car and truck in the world is electric, battery electric by 2050, using today's battery chemistry, which is kind of a crazy assumption, right? We're not going to use today's battery chemistry, but it, for this purpose, let's, let's take that. We're going to use today's relatively inefficient battery chemistries, and you take all the nickel, manganese, cobalt, and nickel, oh, sorry, lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt, you would need for all those batteries between now, of course, about a year and a half ago when I did this, out to 2050. And you take all of that and you add them up and you get billions. Well, one, you look and say, well, how much proven reserves do we have of each of these? And you go, well, actually, we have almost enough proven reserves today without looking for any more to get us into the 2040s for most of those. And then when you start recycling, remember, you can recycle these batteries and get 90, 98, 95% recovery of, of these elements. But And then that the existing reserves plus recycling capability gets you essentially enough resource. Is there enough resource? And of course, we'll keep looking for more of it and we'll find more of it, just like we have with oil and coal and gas and uranium. But the thing is, you take that number and you say, how many billions of tons of this stuff are we going to need? And it sounds really scary when you do that. Billions of tons, geez, we're going to dig up the world. Isn't this going to be awful environmentally? And I always say, add a denominator or change the denominator from one. So yes, we're going to dig up a lot of material for the energy transition. And mining is not a pretty thing. If any of you have never been to a mine, go to one. They're not nice. We're all using stuff that's been mined, right? Everything around us has been mined out of the earth in one way or another, either chopped down if it grew above it or mined out of the ground, right? It's not nice. There are good ways or there are really bad ways to do mining and there's many much less bad ways to do mining, right? Much more environmentally, socially responsible ways to do it. But you look at it and say, so even if we do it all, you know, with the best practices we have and social practices and whatever, isn't this going to be an environmental catastrophe? So let's change that denominator, add a denominator. Instead of divide by one, let's divide it by one year's worth of coal extraction plus one year's worth of oil extraction. So if I take all the energy, all the energy transition metals we're going to need for 100% battery electric vehicle fleet by 2050, and I divide that 30 years worth of metal demand by one year's worth of oil or coal plus oil demand. Anybody have an idea of what that ratio would be? One over what? One over 96. No, no, one over 96, meaning the 30 years worth of metal in tons, measured in tons, is one ninety-sixth of the coal and oil we take out of the ground every day. Think about, I mean, how many, how many barrels of oil a day do we produce? A hundred million. Yeah, a hundred million barrels per day, right? We get out of the ground billions of tons of coal every year. Now, our Good friend Thomas would say, well, it's not a fair comparison because that's the refined metal. You have all the overburden and that. Okay, so make it 100 times more. That's a one over one, right? That's 30 years of demand for, by the way, a product that is almost infinitely recyclable. That's your circular economy. If you're going to know this, heard this term, the circular economy, it's going, to, it's going to come from recycling solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries. Right? Because we have these metals and we want to keep reusing them. We can now all new wind turbines from most European OEMs are essentially 100% recyclable, including the blades. Solar panels are recyclable and now must be mandated to be recycled in places like China and Germany and elsewhere. And batteries are recyclable. There's loads of companies, including co-founders of Tesla that have left to go set up dedicated battery recycling facilities like Redwood Materials, J.B. Stroud. Think about like the idea that says, you know, try and recycle oil. Good luck. 
<laughs> you know, but the idea that if you're a country that has no natural or has no mineral resources, that even if you want to buy batteries, for example, um, from, you know, you have to import all of these, you can mandate that they get recycled within your borders and then you build up the strategic stocks of those metals over time. This is what I mean about impacting geopolitics, impacting balance of trade, where people do business, etc. And it's also one of the reasons that European countries, certainly the U.S. with what's called the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, so our, our colleagues studying policy in the back have probably come across it, you know, the, these are policy measures now being aimed specifically at what are identified as strategic industries to have them located within their borders. And much like China did over the last 20 years, willing to write a check that says we want them here. India has been doing that for solar production, solar panel, uh, panel production. Many other countries are starting to do that for batteries and others. Yeah, please. So just on the on the ratio, it was 196. One over 96, yeah. Of tons of fossil fuels extracted in a year, in, in 30 year. years? No, in a year. So 30, year. 30, 30 years, years of metals. demand of battery metals one year divided by one year of just coal and oil, not natural gas, just coal plus oil, right? Um, it's, a, it's roughly one over 96. And the data for that, if you're curious, want to recreate it, it's from, I think, the 2020 or 2021 Bloomberg net zero scenario um, using existing battery chemistries. And I took the 2019, because yeah, I did it in the year 2020, I took the 2019 production of oil and coal as per the BP Statistical Review of World Energy. Right? So, yeah, you can go and do that calculation pretty simply. Um, and it just gives you that idea of order of magnitude, right? And, and I use that change the denominator mentality all the time. I have for years. Uh, back in the mid 2000s, I did a, an analysis whilst I was at Shell looking at what it would take to electrify every vehicle in the United States and assumed they're all going to become battery electric vehicles. They're each going to have a $10,000 premium to do that. We're going to have to build a brand new power generation system of only renewables to power those vehicles, a brand new continental scale super grid to move the renewables around and all the charging infrastructure. And you come up with some crazy sounding number in, in the mid 2000s, like $3 trillion, you know, and everybody, oh my God, this is pre-financial crisis. People didn't think in such quantities. quantities. But then I simply said, well, let's divide that by the cost of the Iraq war. One, okay, that was $3 trillion. Or let's divide it by years worth of oil imports. At the time, the US is importing about $500 billion a year of oil. Well, okay, six, you know. Or, or incremental military spend, oh, it's five years. You know, you start looking at some of these things and once you realize you change that denominator, you put it in perspective, that's all it is. And you find people, a tool that people use all the time to make their case and be skeptical when I do it too, big numbers, and they use big numbers to scare people, always ask about a ratio or a comparator, right? Um, and that really or what's not. Like you'll hear numbers like, we have to spend $2 trillion a year on the energy transition, isn't that horrible? And go, well, how much do we spend on energy every year now? You know, go, oh, well, okay, what percentage increase is that? Oh, well, okay, it's a certain, you know, and, and when you put the big number out there, it sounds scary. Because most people don't understand the scale of the energy industry or the transport industries or others. So I'm not saying it, I don't mean to be flippant about this at all, this massive investment requirements. This is a huge deal. It's many people like myself and others, like our lives are dedicated to doing this, whole industries, whole companies, etc. But, you know, it's doable and it's being done. So I know we can be really depressed sometimes and say, well, you know, we're, we're not on the path we need to be. Shouldn't we just give up? What I would say is, yeah, we're not on the 1.5 degree pathway, but you know what we're not on anymore is the five degree pathway or the six degree pathway we used to be on. And we're not on the three degree pathway anymore either. We're, we're down, at, I think the current consensus view is that we're at about two and a half degrees, 2.4, something like that it, with confidence intervals on either side, obviously. But what I would say is if you look at a lot of the IPCC numbers, their expectations of where renewables build out will be and costs will be, I would look and go, oh, that's really pessimistic. You know, and so I think that we will then continue to bend that curve. You know, the, the trajectory of emissions has been doing that with everybody always thought it was going to keep accelerating. Now it's doing this. You know, and I think it can come down. It's not going to come down, I don't think, at the pace we need for 1.5, which is like a vertical line at this point. But it's certainly going to start coming down. And one of the best things that people in this room and others can do is work in industry, work on efficiency. You know, you've got whole careers ahead of you. I would say take that effort. It's the, the challenge of the age, right? To try and bend that curve further down. And eventually we'll have to go negative. We'll have to get emissions out of the atmosphere, which again will be powered largely, I think, with wind and solar, uh, direct air carbon capture. And um, we, you know, well, it doesn't mean you keep polluting and doing what we're doing now, but it means that for certain residual emissions that'll be incredibly expensive to abate, like from cement or something like that, <coughs> we might use direct air. If we get to gross zero emissions, or when we do, we're still going to have to go negative. 
we're going to have to be taking CO2 and greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere for centuries. My children's 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 children will still be taking CO2 out of the atmosphere to get us back to equilibrium because we're so far out of the pre-industrial equilibrium. Yeah. Do you think the 1.5 is still manageable or achievable with India's and China's, you know, ambitions? Like 2017 is zero for India, 2035, but the emissions for China. I mean, if you, if you look at the numbers and, and what I, I would point you to instead of my personal opinion, go look at the Carbon Brief, yeah. the UK consultancy that it's worth having a look at. They do these great charts, which just shows, had we gone and started reducing emissions in the year 2000, the slope would look like that. Then 2001, then 2002, and now it looks like this, right? Um, so we're clearly not on that trajectory. Um, the, the way to think about it is, anybody know how much global emissions dropped during COVID? Yeah, it was something like six, seven percent, right? You know, we, we need to drop about that every year. Right. Are we really going to have an incremental COVID every year? Now, I think eventually, sort of 10, 15 years out, might we be accelerating that quickly where we're dropping emissions that quickly? I, I think that's genuinely possible, maybe well before that. But we're not on that trajectory yet, so I can't say that we're on that trajectory. Yeah. One thing I would know um, that is really helpful, in my view anyway, um, we were looking recently uh, with some big consultancies you would know on the, the next two-year power outlook, power fuel outlook in Europe, given the war in Ukraine. Um, and we had the questions about nuclear coming back online. Many don't know, but about half of France, France's nuclear fleet has been offline for the last 18 months for corrosion, right? Uh, planned and unplanned maintenance. And we've had a huge reduction in hydropower performance because of drought, a lot of which is run a river. And this are not stored up in the dam, but just through a river. Um, so we were looking and saying, well, how much of that do we expect? Or did, is the industry consensus expect that to come back? So we're looking at these 100%. And, you know, I looked at the top of that chart and went, whoa, is anybody, is anybody else looking at the top of this, which is the incremental growth in power generation from solar and wind, from new solar and wind this year, 2022, and next year, 2023. Um, and the, the outlook from this large consultancy, I won't, I won't name them, and, and based on forecasting bodies that most of us know, was adding something like 310 terawatt hours of electricity from wind and solar in Europe from last year to this year to next year right, so two years of addition. Um, and you back calculate how many gigawatts that is of each, and you go, yeah, that, that's, that's about right. That seems to be about what we're, we're deploying. Again, change that denominator, 310 terawatt hours means nothing. Um, any idea what that represents of 2021 natural gas-fired power generation across all of Europe? For the whole year? Yes, yeah. So about 48%. So what that's saying is that in a current rates we're doing in Europe, across Europe, including the UK and Norway, is that the amount of new solar and wind we're adding will generate an incrementally new, between 2021 and 2023, 310 terawatt hours of electricity. If I take that and I compare that to the 2021 generation of natural gas, i.e. before the war with Russia and Ukraine, that's 48%. We're in, you know, we've increased clean electrons that could displace half, almost half the natural gas-fired power generation of 2021 in a two-year period. That's, that's amazing. And then you look forward and go, well, solar's continuing to do this. You know, and the estimations for like 2024, I think Bloomberg's current outlook is somewhere between 45 and 55 gigawatts per annum, just in Europe, just from solar. That's like another eight or 9% of that. You know, it, it is really profound. So I, I think there's a lot of good news out there as well. I don't want to just put rose tinted glasses on. I mean, there's a lot of challenges, but what's happening now and the calculus has changed so much because of the war in Ukraine that people are realizing you can employ stuff very quickly. Question of that. You were, you were using figures there for Europe. And in your earlier slides, you were talking about terawatts. Uh, terawatts, yeah, yeah. Additional power, solar power. Yeah. Where are those ter terawatts of additional solar power going to be built over the next few years? Well, if you look at where they're being built now, it is where most of that will happen. Um, it's China, it's India, Southeast Asia, Europe, North America, Latin America. Less so in Africa, because there's just less being built of anything in Africa. Um, so the, the, what has to be true for that to happen? You know, that, that should be a first principles question. You know, in order to actually deploy terawatts a year, as you said, well, where would you put it? And you know, where do you reach saturation, that sort of thing? If you look at South Australia, right? Like South Australia, I won't say it's approaching saturation, but they're approaching saturation of phase one of the energy transition, as we laid out in the electrical sector. If you start adding in a bunch of battery storage, they've got ways to go. They could double, triple, or quadruple you know, the amount of solar they have. And then if you say, okay, well now all the other big, big markets around the world, the China's, the, you know, India's, 
Pakistan's the Middle East, Europe, North America, South America. Loads and loads and loads of headroom to go. And we could we could certainly get to terawatts there, um, just in the power sector, just with batteries. Then you add on electric vehicles. So if I have again, if electric vehicles, you say, if, where are we going to have the power for electric vehicles? If we want to make all the electric, all the cars in Europe or China or America or whatever electric, again ratio, right? They'll use X amount of terawatt hours of electricity a year. Rule of thumb you can use across any of those markets is 100% battery electric fleet will use between 20 and 30% incrementally more electrons than we use today. So not 500 times more, you know, about 28% or 20 to 30% more. So, but you get another big chunk, right? And you'd say, okay, as we electrify the global transport fleet, that's another giant pool of demand. Ultimately, I think it's from hydrogen. Um, it's when you start so much of our global economy, I've got a Sankey diagram in here. Yeah, there we go. Um, if for those of you familiar with Sankey diagrams, of, you know, where the primary and final flows of energy go from and to, a lot of it's heat. So a lot of heat can be electrified by heat pumps and that kind of thing, but a lot of heat is in, is industrial, and we think hydrogen is probably better suited in a lot of those applications. <coughs> and a lot of it is actually needs a chemical, right? So the chemicals industry needs hydrogen. The fertilizer industry, ammonia, needs a molecule. Um, so I think that there's plenty of places where we can imagine where that energy goes, and you just map out where is energy used in the economy. You do that with only solar and batteries and hydrogen, where would that flow? But of course, as I said, we're not only gonna do it with solar, we're gonna do it with a mix of what makes sense in, in which locations. Yeah, please. Do you think there's enough focus going into transmission of all these? No. <laughs> Easy answer, yeah. What, and, and why not, would you say, in terms of why, why not? Why it, it, anybody familiar with the term NIMBY? Which not in my backyard. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, in the UK, we have one I love called banana. There anyone? Um, so it's, it's really, really hard. It, it's hard to build stuff, right? And anybody's ever tried to build anything. You try and build a new house, certainly build anything that crosses multiple property lines. It's really difficult. It could be a pipeline, it could be a power line, it could be a road, train line, HS2 is a great example. Um, it's hard. Um, and they're expensive and they take a long time to plan and permit and all that sort of thing. Um, the US Inflation Reduction Act does a lot, thankfully, for the first time in a long time, to make power transmission lines regulated at the federal level, whereas they weren't before they were states. And individual states would argue, but even within a country like in Germany, the logical quote logical thing for Germany to do would be build a lot of north-south transmission, lots of sun in the south, and and demand, but lots of wind in the north. They have bottlenecks in that transmission. They should be building power lines, but a lot of local activists stop them from doing it. One of the reasons in the UK we stopped building onshore wind and we moved offshore. We have great onshore wind resources here that we barely tapped in England. In Scotland they have, but in England and Wales we barely touched. Um, a lot of that is just nimbyism. Um, and, and I don't mean to be dismissive. Like, I understand why somebody doesn't have a power line in their backyard. So it's just difficult. How much of a blocker do you see that to achieving some of the scenarios? Um, it's, a, it's a blocker for some, but the kind of super gritty type ideas are just being built anyway. Um, the war in Ukraine and Europe has refocused the mind quite a bit on that. Um, that's why we also look at things like pipelines for hydrogen. And I know a lot of people love to pick on it and say, this is a dumb idea. Why would this ever happen? And they explain to you, and it would be like an engineering professor at such a university will, will say things like, well, that's insane. And you know, the conversion of thermodynamic losses, this is nuts. Again, that pipeline that I showed you, the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, carries 60, 60 gigawatts of thermal energy. Converted to electricity, that's 30 gigawatts of electrons, right? In the form of natural gas getting at the other end. Anybody have an idea how big a power line is? In gigawatts? Yeah, I mean, many will be way below a gigawatt. Um, the biggest H current lines in the world in China are maybe three to four gigawatts. So the idea that, and the, the, if you've seen them, right, like these are huge things with these giant passages of land to go through over a thousand kind of kilometers. We, we have pipelines under us right now that you don't know are there, um, moving huge amounts of energy. That's why in an average British household, about 80% or 82% of our energy is from natural gas in a home. Only about 18% is electricity on average. Right? It's primarily space heating, mainly done with natural gas in the UK. Hot water, that's about 80% or 60%. Hot water heating is about 22% and only about 18% is electricity. Um, so moving electrons around is, is pretty expensive. So we do think that there's a role potentially for more and more pipelines that would move hydrogen um, or repurposing. Now that's us, you know, we have a view obviously, so we own a lot of pipelines, but we own a lot of power lines too. Um, but we think there's a real case to be made for conversion of some pipelines that are currently natural gas that might be moving around.
methane kind of you know, waste products turned into biofuel or bio uh, natural gas, uh, biogas, um, or, or green hydrogen in the first instance to move that around. I, I don't think it's a one for one, and we don't think it's a one for one. And we think transmission and distribution of electrons becomes more and more important, plus the potential for seaborne shipment, potentially of hydrogen derivatives, uh, where we can use ammonia or methanol or whatever on the other side. Yeah. Sorry, this question here. Yeah. Um, if you address this directly, I missed it. But um, just how much um, storage um, is available with a uh, go back to your, to your leaf? Yeah. Um, if if all cars in the UK, let's say, new Great cars, yeah, yeah. Uh, only cars, not trucks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> by 2030 or electric. There's a yeah. lot of like, vehicles lot. out there. It's now, yeah. so far, you know, it's been rather undeveloped, this use of them as storage. Uh, but what's the scale if that's a big penetration? That's a phenomenal the, question. So for those online who couldn't hear in the room, um, the question was, what about all the, the vehicle batteries, the electric vehicle batteries? How much storage capacity are we looking at? Is it material, right? Um, again, let's go first principles and just book it and say, well, if we got to 100%, what does that look like? So if all the light duty cars and trucks, meaning you know, vans and that kind of thing, were battery electric in say the UK or Europe or the US. Again, I did this calculation back in like 2005 the first time, but I keep a track of it all the time. The embedded battery capacity in those vehicles is so great that you can essentially turn off your power grid for one to three days. There's that much energy storage in the form of those batteries in those vehicles. Uh, using, I mean, I have a Tesla Model 3, right? It's a 75 kilowatt hour battery. We use about 12 kilowatt hours a day in our house. We have two kids, we have a washer and a dryer and a induction hob and all that kind of stuff. But we people are purchasing house. those um, yeah. on the open market. So they are already, not, and it's, it's if you've already bad. paid in your round in your car. Yeah. Why not use it in what's called vehicle to home or vehicle to grid? So there have been loads of pilot studies looking at vehicle to grid over the last 15 years. Individual utility pilots, there's some really big ones going on in the Netherlands right now with car sharing, uh, with buses, uh, like school buses in America, where they have these electric school buses that are only used for de very defined hours per day, only five days a week and not for three months of the year. Yeah. And they're going, as to your point, we paid for these batteries because they made sense as a battery and, and as the motive power in a vehicle, can we get another use of this battery? So is there a technological reason we can't do it? Not really. So historically, there was a concern that would it degrade the battery too much, right? And cycling the battery too much. Yeah. Um, loads and loads of studies are showing that's not the case. In fact, some really large recently completed studies show actually the opposite, because you're not doing a depth of discharge from 100 to mm -hmm. zero and up again. You're playing around with like 20% in, in the middle. Um, and they found it was actually decreasing degradation of the battery which was really interesting, even the auto OEMs and battery OEMs going, well, that's really interesting, um, which is seeming how a lot of science happens, by the way. <laughs> well, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, but so, yeah, the idea that you can play around with it. The next question is, well, what does it do with the warranty on the battery, right? So you might be Octopus Energy here in the UK, or you might be you know, a power distributor, or you might be an as-a-service software company who wants to do this, what's called a VPP, a virtual power plant provider, uh, or power provider. <laughs> um, but then the auto OEMs might go, wait a minute, on it, we didn't sell it for that yeah. purpose. But what's starting to change, and this is crucial, right? Back to the business model question. Remember, it's not just regulation, it's not just technology, it's business model. You now have Volkswagen, uh, two years ago, said they want all of their cars to be V2G capable. And they're saying we're going 100%, nearly 100% electric. In the last two months, both Ford and General Motors have come out and said, our cars are gonna be V2H, vehicle to home, yeah. capable, if not vehicle to grid. Mm -hmm. GM just announced GM Energy virtual power plant provider with all their cars. So Ford in America, for those of you who know what pickups are, right? Yeah, the Ford F-150 yeah, Ford F one fifty pickup truck is the best selling vehicle in the United States and has been for 40 years. Right? It's a big, it's not actually that pickup trucks go big. We, in the UK, we would think it's obscenely large. Um, but it's, you know, it's a mid-sized pickup truck in America. They have recently come out with the F-150 Lightning, an electric version of that. And they started ads during the US Super Bowl, right? The biggest sort of TV event of the year. Um, and it's like the, the Super Bowl of ads. And so if you talk to the vice president of marketing at Ford, he loves to tell the story, which is, and I've heard this from the National Governors Association in the US, or I spoke to some US governors recently, who all quoted this, this functionality, right? What Ford had said was when they had a bunch of ads showing standard car and truck ads, you know, beautiful woman driving this truck down a road, a guy in a cowboy hat, you know, driving down some dirt road, kicking up mud, and like, yeah, okay, they resonated as you'd expect a truck ad to. 
Then they had an ad where a guy comes home and the lights go off because of a storm, which happens very often in the United States and Canada, more in the US. And he says, don't worry. And he takes out his phone, he toggles the switch, and the lights come back on because the F-150's 100 plus kilowatt hour battery is now running his house. So even though the storm took out the power line, his house is fine and everything's running. Now, where I grew up in Pennsylvania, I'm British and American, but I grew up in Pennsylvania, I, we could see the cooling towers of a nuclear power plant, of a twin unit nuclear power plant from my front door as a kid. And we would still, my family still where they live now, a few miles from there, loses power for about two weeks a year. Because the storms and the weather are so extreme, they've underinvested in the grid, that the grid goes down because of ice storms and tornadoes and hurricanes, and et cetera. So they have a backup generator. The idea that I can ride a bike from their house to the middle of Philadelphia, it's called Center City, Philadelphia, and they have to have a generator in their house because they lose power. Now that resonates. And what Ford will say is that ad sold them 100,000 or more trucks. It just resonated. And I've been recently with, with conservative governors in the Southern US who are not people who are particularly big fans of addressing climate change, but you know, they'll be the first to go, but I want one of those. You know, we own power companies in the South. You talk to people and say, I want, a, I want an electric pickup truck because it's faster, it has more torque, it can tow better, and if I can run all my tools on it and I can run my house on it, I love it. You know, so it's, it's again, business model, finding what resonates with people. I'm personally in the view, it's not a house view at this point, but it's a personal view. I think, and I've said this for years, what got me interested in electric vehicles over 15, actually about 18 years ago, I think electric vehicles are the killer application for renewables and decarbonization. I think they are the glue that starts to bring, back to my interrelatedness of all these variables, they're the thing that starts to bring everything together because it changes the utility value of electricity and enables a massive increase in the amount of renewables that get deployed. It makes people want to have renewables in their homes because all of a sudden I can store it and I can run my car and I can have a virtual oil field on my roof, a virtual power plant on my roof and a virtual oil field on my roof and the batteries either in the car or that I attach to the side of my house that are now cheap because of cars, scaling them. That is the thing that glues it all together and it addresses local air pollution and they're more fun to drive and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I sound like a real evangelist and if you look me up online, you'll see an electric vehicle road trip I did about a year and a bit ago from London to Palermo in Sicily and back again, a 4,000 mile road trip. Um, just to add a bloody mindedness because I was so tired of hearing you can't do a long road trip and maybe I pissed off and I got in the car and I drove to Sicily. Um, and I drove 10 days, 4,000 miles, um, and showed, documented it, this is how it works, and this is how easy it is, and this is how often and how far and how fast and how much, you know, I did. And so I think that vehicle to grid is gonna be the thing that does that. I think vehicle to grid side of it is such an incredible resource that is gonna have all kinds of really interesting impacts, and I'm really excited now. Uh, we have some investments that are related to that space, but it's, it's not, I'm not talking Airbook, there's just so many other third-party companies out there that are doing really exciting things in the V2G space or the vehicle to load space. And to me, it's what excites me most is the auto OEMs themselves who are doing it. And, and I think what will happen first will be fleets. It'll be owners of trucks, it'll be owners of buses, owners of delivery vans and things like that, that will manage it. They think about total cost of ownership in a way that you and I wouldn't, or the average, the average person on the street wouldn't. Um, so they're the ones that I think where that happens first, uh, you know, the, the large fleet owners, because of the way they think about economics. There's a question about yeah, so the question um, was, what about autonomous vehicles and how does that relate to vehicle to home or vehicle to grid or whatever, V2X, sometimes it's called vehicle to whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, my general view is that um, because the total cost of ownership will be so so obvious. The more you drive a car, the more you drive an electric vehicle, the more economic it becomes because the more fuel you save, the more O&M operation maintenance you save. Um, and if you have autonomous electric vehicles, then you would think about how to optimize those because you would have them as a fleet. What I think is unlikely is that everybody's going to have their own autonomous vehicle. Instead, you will start to see a lot of autonomous, autonomous fleet vehicles. And then back to my previous question, I think they will all be optimized and looked at whether those are rental cars, car sharing, robo taxi services, or what have you, delivery fleets. I think people will just look at them and say, here's another source of value I can get out of this asset. How do I sweat this asset? Um, if I owned a fleet of robo taxis, that would be one of the first things I'd be looking at is how can I charge them smartly so that my energy costs are minimal? How can I be paid to provide services to the grid in demand response or ultimately in vehicle to load? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. 
Take more electricity to make alternators. I yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll use a lot of electricity. One, they'll use incrementally ele more electricity than just a standard EV because of all the compute power. That's not insignificant, but it's not massive. Um, and I think if we had electric or AEVs, um, autonomous electric vehicles, you'd probably have more mobility, not less, because the cost per kilometer or cost per mile of driving would go down. Um, so more people would take the Uber equivalent, like the Robo Uber or Robo Lyft. Um, and would that increase electricity demand? Sure. But again, I won't say so what, but you know, it'll increase electricity demand a bit and we'll build more electricity generation as needs be uh, to meet that. But again, it's displacing huge amounts of hydrocarbons. Like the amount of fossil fuel energy you use to move a car around is three to four times greater than what you need from electricity because the internal combustion engine is maybe one third or one quarter as efficient as an electric drivetrain. So you still end up being better off taking crude oil and putting it into a power plant if you want to just say, I have this amount of energy in the form of crude oil and I want to get maximum kilometers out of it. You're better off putting it in a power plant, making electricity out of it, putting it in the EV. Yeah? Um, I have a question about the small modular nuclear reactors. Yeah. Um, you, you were saying after that slide that you don't think more nuclear is necessarily the answer because it's like, sure, it's consistent, but it's at very high costs. Yeah. Um, what's different about small modular reactors? Because that was quite a long way along your X axis, which was kind of impact. Yeah, the impact. So um, for those who didn't hear the question, it was about small modular nuclear reactors. Why do I think that they may not necessarily happen or we don't need them or they're unlikely to happen? And what are the benefits of an SMR, small modular reactor, versus others? Is it fair? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the question, of course, comes from a physicist. Nuclear, or always ask about nuclear. Um, look, I'm not religiously anti nuclear, but I'm also not religiously pro nuclear, right? Nuclear in general has a long grocery list of challenges. Uh, cost to me is the, the biggest elephant in the room, right? Um, and then everybody has their kind of, let's say, pet issue, but their, their personal issue that they have a problem with nukes. Some people, it's about waste. I don't actually worry about nuclear waste that much, but okay, I can explain why. Others worry about safety. Well, nuclear is actually quite safe in comparison to other places, but the tail risk, right? The, if there is a nuclear accident, the risk is really big. And it may not be as big in terms of lives, but it can be in property, or it can be just an economic impact. Think about Fukushima, right? Uh, imagine if Fukushima was a couple hundred kilometers closer to Tokyo. And imagine if you had to evacuate Tokyo for a few months. You know, how many trillions of dollars would that have cost, right? So you know, when you start factoring that in, there is a, there's a cost, a potential risk premium, right, on, on nuclear power. Um, for me, the biggest concern I have with conventional nuclear power is weaponization and increased weapons proliferation, right? Not that you turn the reactor into a weapon, but does the, in, the spread of nuclear technology and depending on the type of reactor, the spread of more highly enriched uranium lead to uh, an increase in nuclear weapons, um, which I think is, yes, again, it's a personal opinion, right? Not a company opinion. Um, it's, it's one of my biggest concerns beyond cost. Because I think you can convince me that nuclear is valuable enough worth paying for you're not going to convince me it's cheap just based on evidence, right? There, there is no evidence that I see out there that says nuclear power is cheap uh, and nuclear power as we build it today is cheap. Now, why are SMRs interesting? Small modular reactors. One of the problems with conventional nukes is they're really, really big. That's a benefit. They're gigawatts of scale in one place. But you can't make lots and lots and lots of them on an assembly line. And you don't get this what's called Wright's Law in economics, the learning curve effect that with every cumulative doubling of making a widget, the cost of making that widget gets cheaper <coughs> by some kind of fixed percentage. It's not a thermodynamic law of nature or anything. It just seems to be observed in dozens and dozens of industries over many decades, right? The hope behind a small modular reactor, kind of like a, a modular meaning a few tens of megawatts up to maybe 100 megawatts or, or thereabouts, maybe even a few hundred megawatts, is that these could be much smaller pieces of kit that could be made in a factory on an assembly line where you can get the benefit of making many of them, so the cost comes down, you learn by doing, and also the individual investment in a power plant is reasonable. To build, say, Hinkley Point C in the UK is like 35 or 40 billion pounds. I mean, EDF can't do it, and you know they've just been nationalized by the French government because they're suffering so much. There's no private companies that can build that number of reactors, and it's even beyond the balance sheets of many countries, <coughs> smaller countries. So the hope of an SMR is that you can make them smaller, you can make them safer 
we're inherently safe, you know, kind of plug and play and forget kind of reactors, almost like a nuclear battery, some of the ideas we're looking at. Um, they can be contained, they can be inserted in very easily, they can be distributed around, to your point, on transmission, because transmission is an issue with nuclear, right? If you build a four gigawatt nuclear power plant somewhere, you have to have a four gigawatt line to distribute that. That's not easy unless you already have a power line. Um, so the idea of SMRs is that you distribute it the more, which is actually a good thing for a lot of renewables. And that all sounds great. Um, there's an old joke about nuclear fusion that fusion is 40 years away and has been for 50 years. Um, now maybe it's only 10 or 20 years away, um, away, but it's still 8 or 15 years away. Um, SMRs have been 10 years away for 40 years. Um, and, you know, in about a decade ago, um, I remember meeting with a bunch of SMR companies in New York at a, at a tech summit and being explained to me about how, you know, SMRs do this and they do this and they cost that and they work this way. And, and I couldn't help but be a smart ass, which I'm sure you'll be, find hard to believe. And I just played dumb and I said, hey, that's great. You know, where do I buy three of them? Um, and I said, I was at a round at the time and said, I would love, like, can we buy three or four of these? And every Ready to sign up kind of thing. I said, but we just have to do our due diligence, so I need to go visit some. And everybody went quiet, like, well, dude, who's going to tell them? Right? Yeah, they don't exist. You're talking about these things in the present tense. They're an idea on paper, right? Now, there are some designs that are getting closer to getting uh, FERC approval in the US, uh, Federal or Nuclear Energy Regulatory Commission, um, which is great, um, but we'll see. And they were supposed to be, what I was told by these companies over a decade ago, or a decade ago was that they would be operational, commercially operational already. They're not, now it's 2030. Uh, the cost targets they have for what the cost of electricity would be has gone up, not down. Um, but it still could work, right? Like to me, if an SMR can do what it says on the tin, and crucially for me, it doesn't exacerbate weapons proliferation, I'll be the first one to help them sell them, right? I, I think it could be a great thing if it, if it can work. Yeah, that. It's sort of like a spider diagram. You know, everybody yeah. knows what I mean by spider diagram. Imagine all these different challenges of cost, time to build, accident, terrorism risk, geopolitical risk vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine right now, as we're seeing, right? Um, weapons proliferation, et cetera, et cetera. Many of the solutions to one or two of those variables exacerbates one of the others. It's like the balloon analogy. You squeeze it and it goes somewhere else. If somebody can have a reactor design that addresses all of those and makes them all better, and it can do it in anything even approaching commercial viability, I think they're great. I think we should be pursuing them. And, and what I have said publicly to regulators before is, I do think it's a thread of research and development and crucially and deployment that government should be supporting because the upside is potentially great, but there's still a real risk that it doesn't work. But the upside is big enough that I think that merits government attention. So that right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I have a follow-up question. If no okay, well, there's question. another one and then I'll come okay. back. Yeah, yeah in, in your list there, um, issues with nuclear reactors, you didn't uh, put in the one where are you going to site them. Yeah. If you're thinking of the UK and you say you want to put a nuclear reactor anywhere, you're going to have a massive campaign against it. Well, you say that. We already have a bunch of nuclear reactors in the UK. I know. Um, we, we, have, we have half a dozen. Yeah. Half a dozen sites that we can put nuclear reactors on those sites. Well, there's, I, I would venture. On a new site. On a new site, I would still venture that you UK and that there'd be a lot of places willing to take them. Um, really? Yeah, I, I do actually. I, I think that, and, and, and I'm, again, yeah. my vested interest in almost the opposite, but I, I think I think you could. Yeah. And I think because the land, the, the, one of the pro arguments for nuclear is the energy density argument here all the time. The amount of land that takes <coughs> to build a nuclear reactor is so small relative to the power you get that even if you said at the sites like in the north coast of Scotland, you know, I've ridden my bike past one of the reactors on the north coast up by Thurso. <laughs> to it you know could you could you double up capacity at some of these places probably you know even at existing intricate grid connections are there enough other places around the country that would say hey look there's five thousand construction jobs or there's a hundred construction jobs or whatever that would get people to build them yeah i think you probably could i mean we're not going to know that it's a counterfactual right or a hypothetical but it, there is that problem citing now smrs one of their advantages is they are much smaller. And if they are inherently safe, like some of them that are really radically new designs that are intuitively safer, we think, but again, it needs to be proven, right? And how does one prove that? Um, but the idea that you can put them in much smaller capacities, like in industrial sites, you can imagine saying, well, we've got a big industrial cluster up on, on Humberside or up on Teesside or up in 
Liverpool or whatever, could you put something there? And there are a lot of industrial sites who are saying, we would love to have these things. Because remember, some of these are already running, you know, much more dangerous, um, large, you know, physical chemical operations. If you've been to a pet company or, you know, others, the, these are not, these are not no risk assets, right? So these are people that understand industrial risk and are, and are happy to look at those. So I, I think that the SMR argument there is that they could allow you to deploy in other places that negate some of the need for new transmission capacity that can be built on a modular basis so that you might have an existing reactor that is three gigawatts or one gigawatt or whatever a site, but you can start adding blocks to it, you know, blocks of 100 megawatts at a time and build up over time. I mean, that, that's the theory. But again, nobody's built these yet. And nobody probably will have them commercially available for another decade or another five years at the least, you know, until they really start scaling. And then they're going to have to run for a while to prove that they're safe and they do what they say in the tin and all that stuff. So again, I really hope they work. But to your, the earlier question about are we in the 1.5 pathway, you're not, that's not going to get you there in the next 10 years, right? The things that you can deploy and scale are wind and solar and some other storage technologies and some other generation technologies and the like. Nuclear might be a part of that going forward. Um, but to do it at scale is just really challenging. That makes sense. Yeah. And you had a follow-up question. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, given all the issue, potential issues with SMRs, um, and that I think on the diagram it was fifty dollars per megawatt hour. Yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah, the, yeah. The, the targets that some of them are talking about. But that's still stuff. a lot more expensive than is. Bond, it's just that energy density. Well, it's two things. It's the energy density and it's the base load production, right? Yeah. As I said, you don't need base load. Yeah. But if you have base load and say it's relatively cheap and it's always on, maybe if you made it not base load, it might be $80 megawatt. And for firm power capacity of a certain percentage of the mix, that might be valuable enough that it actually keeps your whole system cost down. Because you can't, you can't just say solar costs two cents a kilowatt hour and that's what your electricity optimization costs. So some of that firm capacity that you need for certain times of the year, and that makes sense. One of the arguments people make for nuclear, which I think is wrong, is that nuclear will be the way to generate hydrogen the most cost effectively. Um, and the reason I don't, well, I'll show you why I don't think that. Um, this is the reason I don't think that. Um, there's three elements to think about in the cost of green hydrogen production. One is what is the cost of an electrolyzer, the device that you separate <coughs> hydrogen apart from oxygen. How efficient is that? How often do you run it? And then what is the cost of the electricity, right? So on the left, you see the capital cost, right? So CapEx and OpEx, capital expenditure, operational expenditure. This is the cost per kilogram of different electrolyzer, or of electrolyzers at different costs, from 100 up to $800 a kilowatt, right? They're currently somewhere in the 400 to $1,000 a kilowatt range. We think they can get much cheaper, hence we use some of the low ends. And what you're seeing on this Pareto kind of curve is, how often do I run it, utilization? And on that cost basis, what does that give me as my amortized capital cost of hydrogen, right? And a little less cost of hydrogen for the capital. So if I say $200 a kilowatt, which is this line, you can see that once I start, if I only run this 5% of the time, I have incredibly expensive hydrogen, right? If I run it 20% of the time, I'm down to about 60, 70 cents a kilowatt, or 60 or 70. And if I run it 40% of the time at about 35 cents or 40 cents a kilogram, but it's a real diminishing return to keep running it, the difference between 25 and say, or 35 and 100%. The argument for nuclear is, well, we can run it 100% of the time. Well, offshore wind in the UK can do it here, just with offshore wind. Solar in the UK can do there. Solar plus wind can get you probably around here. Um, plus a bit of hydro or some batteries or whatever you might get it to here. So the question ultimately is over here. What is the cost per dollars per megawatt hour of electricity? And that's pretty much a linear relationship. So for every $10 a megawatt hour or one cent a kilowatt hour at thermodynamic limits of efficiency, we think, or the current limits of efficiency, or the current efficiency, roughly ballpark, every $10 a megawatt hour adds half a dollar a kilogram. Now, these units might mean nothing to you. What's a dollar a kilogram and what's good, what's bad? Low is better, <laughs> you know, cheaper is better. The, the target people have in mind is between one and two dollars a kilogram, right? So if you want to get to one to two dollars a kilogram, you're going to need electricity no more expensive than, say, two dollars to thirty dollars per one hour. Probably more like ten to twenty, which, as Mama knows, we know where you can certainly do this right already today and do it with 
capacity factors in this range. Now, as electrolyzers get cheaper, at $800, that utilization means more. But as the cost of the electrolyzer comes down, the relative value of running more becomes really small. Nuclear advocates and hydrogen is, what's your cost of electricity? Now, you might say my short-run marginal cost of a fully depreciated nuke that's 40 years old is $20. Hey, good for you, but we're talking about needing to build terawatts of new power capacity to make that amount of hydrogen. I need to know what your new build cost is. Now, you might say I can run my, my nuclear reactor and sell electricity for a portion of the day, and then the portion of the day I don't need it, I can kind of cross-subsidize and I can discount my electricity. I mean, then you're just playing accounting games, in my view, right? But ultimately, we're going to have to have dedicated power generation that just makes hydrogen if you're really going to get to these kinds of levels of green hydrogen production and, and net zero, I, I think. Right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think I might have finally answered all the questions. Yes. Um, I'm going to wrap up there because I could go on for hours. For those of you who are doing or might do an MBA or an exec camera, I think it's just the MBA program. Um, I normally join Cameron Hepburn, who's at the Smith School. You probably know Cameron. Um, for his Energy Markets Week for the MBA program. And some of you I may have seen at the MSC in Energy, um, I don't know if it's Energy Economics or whatever he teaches. Uh, I'll be doing that in February, I think. But we do a kind of longer version of this, where we go through as part of their Energy Markets Week, where other people from industry are brought in. Um, it, it'll be you know heads of Shell New Energy, and it'll be you know myself, and it'll be people like Michael Deepright, and, and others will come in and, and normally talk about this stuff, all with different perspectives, interesting perspectives. Um, you know, might want to approach Cameron at some time and see if you can audit one of those classes. But uh, thanks very much for your time. And for people online, thanks a lot. Um, and I'll call it a day and I'll stick around for a little bit if people have other questions. But thank you very much. Thanks.